Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Nicodemus. I am the Assistant Director of the Center for the Arts at Albright. Uh, I am here to introduce Alan Moyer. He is our guest speaker today. Uh, it's going to be just an informal talk. He's going to kind of go around the room. We're going to take a little tour of the space. And while we're taking a tour of the space, we will uh, get a little bit of insight into the background of some of the pieces, some of the touchstone pieces, keystone pieces that Alan has had over his career. And uh, we'll keep it really informal. If you have any questions, by all means, please put them in the comments. I can ask them of Alan. And at the same time, uh, we have some people in the crowd here, so if they have questions, I would encourage them to also ask uh, Alan those as well. And let's just keep it like a, like a talk, like a nice conversation. All right? Alan? <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Hello. I've been allowed to take off my mask, which I appreciate very much. Um, well, I think we'll start here. First of all, thanks for joining us. Um, this has been a really fun, uh, gratifying experience to put this show together. Um, I, I, I can't help but think it's nothing but a huge vanity project, but it's been fun, <laughs> I have to say. So I'm glad you're interested. In, but um, I, I've done virtually no preparation for this today. So I'm going to be a little extempore here, and uh, we're just going, to, just going to look at some of these. Some we'll talk about, some I'll just tell you what it is. Um, I don't know. There's probably some way that you can um, find other images of these things on, on the, the web somewhere and, and, and see more detail. But um, let's start here. But this is a, a production of the Flying Dutchman that I did <coughs> in... Um, I have to look at the tags because I forget. <laughs> Uh, 1996 was when we did it first, and it was done for Canadian Opera Company, and it's been done a number in, in Toronto, and it's been number, done in a number of other places, and and they've revived it. It was a big hit for them, so they've revived it, uh, I think, four times already, and the fifth time is coming up in the um, in the fall this year. We were supposed to do it in uh, 2020, and it was interrupted by the pandemic. So um, this was a pretty abstract uh, version of the show. It was directed by uh, Christopher Alden. Uh, there are a number of models in this show for things I've done with Christopher. It's one of my, one of my favorite collaborators, but it's, it's, it's uh, safe to say that the, most of these shows in the show are, um, uh, represent things with my favorite collaborators. So, um, <laughs> may, might not have made it otherwise. There might be one or two, but anyway. Um, and were you their favorite collaborator as well? I'm sure I'm not, but uh, <laughs> one of their favorites as well. Okay. That's, if, we, if we stick to that, I think they would say I'm one of their favorites, just like I'm saying they're some of my favorites, yes. right? Um, so when you say collaborator, yes. what would that mean that they are the director? The director is the most important collaborator for me. Sure. And then along with that, there's uh, the costume designer and the lighting designer. Um, the conductors are generally not, as you're preparing a production, one of your collaborators, but just because they're not available, or sometimes the co if you're working on a new piece, the, the the librettist and the composer are a part of the process, which is wonderful actually. And when you're working on plays, it's very often you'll have a playwright that's around too, that you can you know act, that's actively involved. So maybe but, four or five people. Yeah, and and ideally you all work together from the start. Ideally, it often doesn't happen just because people are so busy that they can't all be available. Mm -hmm. So it's often me and the director. I ask a question about, about conducting mm -hmm. conductors. Do, um, what kind of conversations do you have to, with conductors about acoustics of the space? Well, generally, you don't have those because they're not involved from the start. Now, in the case uh, in the case of the Orfeo, which we'll look at later. Um, that piece was that was conducted by that was at the Met, and it was James Levine was the conductor, and it's uh, uh, directed and choreographed by Mark Morris. And Levine had said, just to Mark at one point, "Oh, I'd love if it could be as downstage as it could be, simply because there there's a countertenor involved, and countertenors are often th th because of." Is, Am I right, Jeff? Because of the way they produce the sound, it's not, it's, it's difficult for them to have the same, they're using a different physical uh, process to produce the sound, and so they don't have the same tools that other singers have to, to get the sound out. So it's, it's a little different. Like the difference between uh, 
um, four-wheel drive and regular just two-wheel drive. There you go. The countertenders are on two-wheel drive. Uh -huh. They're on different parts of the cord, so it yeah. just can't get as much e Exactly, power. yeah. And, and oddly enough, someone told me one time, and I think this is true, that most people, a lot of people think a countertenor is probably a tenor, a natural tenor that's singing that way. They're almost always baritone, naturally baritones. That then are, is it right? Yep, absolutely. I thought that was so fascinating yeah, because I never would have guessed the that. The cords themselves have to be bigger to start with, longer to start with. Is that true? To to, to get Isn't that them. interesting? Yeah. Anyway, Steve so learned something today. Yeah. But um, sometimes, so, so Levine said, uh, anything you could do to keep it downstage would be great. And we, we took that to heart and actually that show, it's a little, it was a little weird to be on stage because there's, it was actually sort of over the, part of it was over the pit a little bit, which is kind of weird for, the Met never, never does that, but it was interesting. But we'll talk about that when we get to that. And a lot of time, I, I do tend to do a lot of, part of my natural aesthetic is I love things that are boxes, and I also love ceilings. And so um, a lot of singers like singing in the sets that, I just, I, you know, I did a production of Abduction from the Seraglio, which is not represented in the show, that were, uh, it was all set on the Orient Express, and they were all, that's right, you did that, didn't you? They were all, um, they were all miniature boxes, and so people love singing that because they're like loudspeakers, <laughs> yeah. and, and actually this one, yep. case in point, this acoustically was fantastic. Um, because there's, and it's all hard surfaces. That's just what everybody wants. But I mean, just this is like an orchestra shell. <laughs> I mean, you could not ask for better acoustics in these things. So uh, that that's always uh, that always goes over big, as it should. Why not? You know, the theaters that these people have to sing in and produce the sound are, are massive. So if you could help them out somehow, if it works, then why not? But um, this piece is um, generally done three acts. We did it in the original. Wagner intended it to be done without intermission, uh, which I really love. It's amazing what the, and there's music, there's transitional music and everything, which is all chopped up when you're separating it up into three separate uh, acts and two intermissions. It's a shame. And part of the transition was really exciting. Um, that's one of the things that Christopher really, really excels in, is doing these exciting transitions. If we talk about the Flater Mouse, we could talk about that too, because we also did some Au Vista things with that, and they're often some of the most exciting parts of the show, uh, I say. I think so. But there's a sketch over on the wall as part of the show that shows what we did in the first act, which is involves a, a, a sail, because it's on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the sh on a ship, uh, and so there was a sail that raised and lowered, and then people in, in the first act, and then they take it out as part of the transition to get into the second act, which was uh, uh, meant to be a, a kind of, in our version, sort of mill almost, but um, supposed, it's the, 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 supposed to be women spinning. So we did it in a little more industrial way, like it was uh, by the mill. On this show, I did the costumes too, and so there's one less collaborator in the room. <laughs> Which I always miss. I, I like that, but I always miss that there's one less person. And it's harder to find interesting people to have dinner with when, there's, when you're doing the second costume. Of both. But anyway, these are costumes for the show, uh, some of them. Um, you can see that. We set it in the 1920s. Um, we, and, and also in a kind of, it has a little bit of a shaker feel to it because we wanted it to feel like it was a, a society that was slightly restrictive mm -hmm. and um, homogenous. And that then there was this woman, young woman, Senta, who somehow had different ideas and was looking for a different life. And her yearning for the Dutchman, in our minds, was um, a yearning to get out. And so all the women had the same dress. The difference was that Senta had a haircut. <laughs> she had a 20, she, she sort of, she had a different idea, uh, and so that's how she stood out. Um, the one at the end is at the, the last act where there's a big uh, celebration um, for the two crew, for the, the men are home, they're having a, uh, a big party, all their wives come and bring food, and the women 
go in their sort of factory everyday dresses, but they accessorized with some green fur coats and things and shoes and lots of makeup. Um, so uh, this was the, the Dutchman is here. It was done a little bit like a, a, a kind of period aviator in a strange way. Um, his crew were dressed like prisoners. And so many people, it's interesting because it, it was on our mind, but setting in the 20s, you're doing prisoners. You know, if you take those stripes and turn them the other way, it's a totally different thing. <laughs> and uh, so many people were like, oh, they were dressed like they were concentration camp victims. Like, stripes didn't go that way. They went the other way. <laughs> but anyway, it was interesting to, I think the idea of it being a suggestion, I think was really, was very redolent and interesting to people. Um, so. And then this was sent as wedding dress for the last act when they were getting married. And at the end of the of the, uh, the the Dutchman's crew, is we never saw a separate ship for the Dutchman's ship, but this became lit totally differently. The Dutchman came up from below on those circular stairs, and his crew all appeared in this sort of wrecked pier underneath. You saw them in in light, and so you didn't ever really see someone stand. You know, they were all underneath all the time. The Dutchman, though, at one point, where she towards the end, one point he sort of bears himself to her and he, she takes his she, he unbuttons his coat she takes it off his shoulders and he's dressed in the prisoner uniform too because in a way the Dutchman in this legend is a prisoner, he's, he's prisoner to the, the, the fate his fate which is wandering every, mm, every seven years he's allowed to come back and um, walk on land and search for um the only thing that will save him is to find um, a woman whose uh, perfect love and unselfish love will redeem him from his curse. So that was a beautiful moment, actually, in the show when he takes off this big coat. And, and at one point, I think she puts it on. She put it on as well. Very Christopher thing. Right? So anyway, so that's the Flying Dutchman. Any other questions from the gang here? So good. it'll be fun to see it again in the fall. Uh, the next show is Lysis Strada Jones, which is one of my, f I, I, I absolutely love this musical. It's written by um, the playwright uh, uh, Douglas Carter Bean, who I've done many of his plays, and he's from Reading, Pennsylvania. I didn't meet him here, but we met in New York. And it's basically the play uh, Lysis Strada, but set in a community college, or a, I don't know if it's a community college or a college, and it's... Um, so the, the, all of the, the, the young women in the show uh, decide that they're tired of cheering on their boyfriends that are the, the basketball team because they don't take it seriously and they always lose. So they say to their boyfriends, unless you win, we're going to stop having sex with you. And so it's basically the same as the playlist is brought up where the, the, the women, the, the Greek women say, um, we're, we're tired of you fighting wars all the time and we want you to stay home and if you can, if, as long as you continue fighting uh, battles, we're not going to have sex with you. So it's a, a modern take on the story uh, and um, it's always been a play I really like because when I was a student at Albright, um, Lynn Morrow directed a production of here. It was my first exposure to Alyssa Strada was Lynn Morrow and doing it here at Albright, working on the production. I helped make helmets. Was this um, your first exposure to basketball as well? Well, it probably was. <laughs> you know, well, I think I saw I saw some basketball games at high school, so oh, I knew okay. some of the things. Yeah. But uh, I don't think these two have, have ever been to a game. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but um, anyway, this was the finale of the show. Uh, basically, it took place on what looked they were, you know, it was a show that had I think I had you know, there were a total of three basketball hoops in the show, which was incredible. Um, the band was on stage, and uh, it was a marvelous show. Um, it was actually one of the most well-reviewed musicals when it opened on Broadway. Um, it was, had a short run because it was not produced very well. Let's put it that way. It was too bad. I felt awful because some of the people... There was someone in the show that when we were teching it uh, had his, I believe, his 19th birthday. 
And I just felt so terrible for these kids that were, you know, that were so excited about it. And then the people who were supposed to be the adults and take care of those situation to make a show run really dropped the ball, <laughs> dropped the ball <laughs> and disappointed everyone. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's okay for me to be disappointed. It just horrified me that these kids were just so... Uh, but Patty Murin was in it, who's, you know, now she's a big star. And, uh, and also Josh Segarra, who's also done really well. Um, so, it was a wonderful show. There's some clips on the video here. And listen to the music, it's fabulous. But uh, This is a production that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, for years, people would say to me, what's your, your favorite production you've ever done? And I used to be sort of coy about it because I'm like, oh, you're not supposed to have favorites, right? And then I thought, well, that's really being disingenuous. Of course you have favorites. So let's decide how you would pick a favorite. And I thought to myself, well, what, what show would I like? To, if I could see any show I've done before, what would it, tonight, what would it be? And my answer is always the mother of us all. Second would be Grey Gardens, uh, which is a musical I did um, a number of years ago as well. But I absolutely adore everything about this piece and about this production. We've been lucky enough to do it three times. We started the Glimmerglass Opera, then it was done at New York City Opera, and then in the expanded version, which I think this is the model for San Francisco, uh, we did it at San Francisco Opera. And uh, my dear friend Jeff Lance, who's here today, was in all three productions <laughs> and was brilliant. But Actually, it was uh, a really special piece, and I have no idea why. We did it in 1998. I mean, it's a piece that's always, I think, important and relevant. But why it has not been revived over the last 10, 15 years, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I really don't, because it's, everything that's in it is while it was interesting and relevant at the time, has become absolutely essential as far as thinking. It's, it's, it's even more, I, I just think it's even, it's just a, it's an incredibly powerful piece. It's you know, Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson was their second and final collaboration. Uh, she never, she died before it premiered, which is very sad, but it is absolutely brilliant. And if you don't know it, I try to get the one recording of it that exists. Yeah. And was this, this must have been filmed. It's, it's at the record, I'm sure it's at the... Yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a broadcast. No, yeah. but anyway, the piece itself, the piece is just one of the most brilliant things. Um, the, the score and the, and the libretto, it's just remarkable. So, <clears throat> this was a, a, a production um, it's 12 Angry Men, the play, which, believe it or not, had never been on Broadway. It had been in every high school in the United States, <laughs> but had never been on Broadway. And it was done in 2004. My husband, Paul, was a lighting designer for it. Um, it was very successful, and it had a national tour that, I, I don't know if it was every year or two years. It ran on Broadway for a long time, too, meaning 18 months or something like that. I believe. Um, it had a remarkable cast. And unfortunately, a lot of, you know, I was thinking about it when I was um, putting this together and out of the, well, th there's actually 13 people in the show because there's a um, you know, policeman as well that guards the door and comes in every now and then. But of the, of the 12 main jurors in the thing, I think, I think five of them, five, five of them, I think, have died. Maybe there might even be a six. And some of them, because they were, you know, when they did this piece, were in their 70s, you know. But um, a few of them uh, have had, you know, untimely early deaths, which is very sad. Um, but it was a wonderful production. One of the things you don't see here in this model is, well, unless you're where I'm standing, you can kind of see it, but <laughs> the, the set did this wonderful move, lateral move that went over towards um, a, a, a stage left, and there's a bathroom over there, because there's a, one or two scenes where, uh, which are sometimes not done, they're just done sort of in the corner of a room, but uh, it was the, the guys go into the, a bathroom and they had a conversation. It was really an interesting, because then you're watching the, the set, watching the other thing as, as you're seeing this, these two guys talking 
in the bathroom, which was fascinating, you know, washing their hands and talking about things. It presented a lot of challenges because you want to be able to keep the lighting kind of the same as it moves. And also, earlier in the show, there was a, um, there was a rainstorm. And so, um, out the window, you would see the rain, and it was real water. And so you have to have that, and it all has to be able to move. So that was a particular challenge. But um, we figured it out. It was uh, pretty effective. But this is a transfer, or did this start on Broadway? It was, on, it was at the Roundabout in their Broadway space. It was directed by Scott Ellis, who I've done many, many shows with. And um, you know, it, was a, it was a very difficult show to design, in a way, because you have, it's a central problem is you have a long table with 12 people around it. Well, you can do like a lot of, there are pictures from an English production, for instance, who I think was maybe, I think it was directed by Harold Pinter, I want to say, in the early 2000s or late 90s. And they cheated because they had, they had a long table and all the jurors were just sitting on the one side of it. Like, well, that's not how it works. Uh, and the other thing, too, was, exactly. The other thing that was interesting is, you know, we went to the Scott and I went to the building in Manhattan where this happened. And the thing that was remarkable to me was that for something that's so important to our world and our society and our democracy, and that is the, a place where jurors meet and have these discussions and decide on these things. The rooms were absolutely, it was upsetting, it, it, it was depressing. Broken chairs pushed in the corner. Um, over the bathroom, there would be like toilets with like yellow tape over like broken. None of the furniture matched. So it was, I thought to myself, isn't this something that this is what we, the, and the rooms were, were just absolutely decrepit as far as hadn't been painted for years, water stains, it was just absolute mess. And I thought, this is how we regard, this is how we support this process. I thought, well, wouldn't that be interesting in the set? Because a lot of times, like, even when you see the movie of this, it's like, oh, pretty brown wood and stained and whatever. Let me tell you, it's not like that at all. And so I thought that would be a fascinating take on this piece. Let's really, really show what it really looks like. And there was something about it that I think it, Scott one time said, gosh, I think it's made it more exciting because we see this and then we see these guys when they start out and they're sort of begrudgingly there. And he said, part of the thing about this play that's so beautiful is that people, you see the part where they start to really take their job seriously. And he said, I think that the counterpoint of what that room looks like, is, is adding to that drama. So, but it was a very hard show to stage, and, and Scott, who's a wonderful director, I, I, everyone thought, oh my God, this is one of the most beautifully directed things I've ever seen, because he managed, like there were, he managed to keep people with their backs to the audience. It all feel, felt very, very natural. And, and, and it was lit almost, it, it, was, it was almost naturalistic in the way it was lit too. At one point, you know, they, they, they turn on the fluorescent lights. <clears throat> I mean, it wasn't just the fluorescent lights, but it certainly felt like it. So, 12 Angry Men. Um, these two here are, are two productive. I've been so lucky that I've done Norma twice in my life. Norma is one of the most remarkable pieces of music ever written. And most people don't get to do it at all, ever. And I've had a chance to do it twice. And uh, when I was working on putting together this show with Yacht Van Leer, who was a representative from the Freedmen to help me uh, pick pieces. He loved the idea of having these two models because he said, I think it's important for people to see that you sometimes do pieces and that when you do them, they're remarkably different depending on when you do them and with who you're doing them with. So this production was in early on in my career, 1992, at the Minnesota Opera. Uh, and then later, in 2006, different director, different place. This was also in Toronto, a Canadian opera company, and San Francisco Opera. This is another production of Norma. And I think that, I think it's fair to say that they couldn't be more different, could they? But it just shows the different 
point of view. I remember in that piece, we, we were sort of reminded of um, the famous quote, which I'm probably paraphrasing from um, Stravinsky, because Stravinsky described the Rite of Spring uh, as a hot dance in a cold place. And we were sort of thinking of that with the first Norma, that it was a very hot, passionate piece in a cold place. And why, why not make it look like it's let it's all on snow or ice? And so that's what that piece was. This, we just took a totally different approach. And this, I thought, you know, this is a society that's been, that's totally subjugated. They're basically the prisoners. They've been taken over by Romans. It's a Druid society. So what would be the worst thing to a Druid society than people coming in and imprisoning them and they cut down all the trees that they worship and make a cage for them, basically. And that's what this is. And it was based on the work of a Japanese sculptor. Um, I should have prepared for this. <laughs> Marvelous work. Um, starts with a K, anyway. Uh, it was inspired by his work. And, and oftentimes, at, at that point, I was looking at pictures um, uh, where he takes basically lumber or his most one of his pieces was done in a lot that was a building had been demolished between two buildings big buildings like a bank building and something else and he did this thing it almost looked like he took the material that was left there from being demolished and made this sort of cyclone out of it it was absolutely beautiful so things changed in this there were walls at the side that moved on uh, but um, mostly it was this set up for most of the things. I mean, it's such a good point. I think that, that uh, the uninitiated might think, oh, well, you do this play, and this is what it's going to look like, inevitably. Yeah. And this shows that that's not it. That's a, the designer a good, does a good everything. point, John, and that is that, um, you know, I think people think that, first of all, they think at the back, at the back of the script, yeah. There's, yeah. there's a picture and, you, and that this is what you do and that you just sort of fill out the blanks, you know. Most people have no idea that it's a completely blank canvas yeah. when you start. And it's all about how you all personally feel about it, you know. It's like, that's the thing is, to me, the process is, is initiated by the discussion about how do we, as a group of people here doing this show, how do we feel about it? Like, What's our point of view about it? Um, and, and then you decide, is there a period in history that would best, would, would allow us to best illustrate or explain that point of view? Or is it less about a period and is it more about amalgamation periods or is it less not about that at all is, is it better if it feels timeless mm -hmm. does that serve our idea and the piece best so you're making all the decisions about it and so and and it's interesting because i also don't understand that uh, uh you, you know as, as the designer and, and often because you start oftentimes where you know back to our point about it, it's nice if we're all in the room when you go right down to it it's generally the director and the set designer in a room first. And those discussions often happen first with those two people, and then it expands, right? Um, and so it really, the, the designers in general, um, and I'm not saying this just beca because I'm a designer, but we have outsized influence teacher of mine always said, you know, the truth is that the only people who really believe the show is really going to happen are the designers. <laughs> because they're the ones that six months, two years, three years out are making these plans. And they've drawn up plans, they've made models, they've had discussions with scene shops about building it or costume shops about building them. You know, lighting designers have sent out, they, they, like, they've sent out their shop order, they decided how they want to light it and what instruments that we're the ones that sort of know it's going to happen. The, the director doesn't really know that, so like, they start rehearsal. <laughs> and usually like, we're way ahead of that. I mean, you have to be, to be able to have a, a set ready, you, you, you can't just wait till four weeks before the thing opens, like a, a, 
a, a typical rehearsal time in the United States, you know, or four weeks until you're in the theater at least. So people don't quite understand. Um, but, and, and I, there are some designers that are become uncomfortable as the longer they work in the fact that a lot of the work that they do is kind of uncredited. It's never bothered me. I, I, I it's not what I, you know, it's, it, that's, it's, it never bothers me really. I, I'm just happy to be part of it. I enjoy the process so much. And generally the people that I work with that I continue to work with do credit all of their collaborators, you know. Um, uh, so, so that's fine. But also, it, to me, it's not, it's, you know, I've always done this because of what, I do it for my, I mean, I don't mean to seem selfish, but I do it for myself. And um, I, it's about me being pleased with what the result is and feeling like we've, I've done the best job. If other people like it, that's an added bonus. But it's not about that, really. And frankly, what I love most about the whole process is, especially in opera, that I'm in there and there are a hundred people in the pit and there are the people on stage and I'm one of the only, like the ten people that get to watch that day after day after day before an audience comes in and I think to myself, what a privilege, you know, and, and that every time you're studying these pieces, these great pieces that you get to spend your life with, you know, you spend your life with Shakespeare and Mozart, I mean, come on, how lucky are you, can so. I, can I just add I want to say thank you for talking about that, especially in an academic institution mm -hmm. where questions of what constitutes scholarship is always up for grabs. Yes, yes. And everybody always thinks about the final product, but not the amount of importance there is in the collaborative and creative process to actually yeah. make the final. Product. It's all it's all about process, and if it's not, you're not doing you're not doing your job, you know. That's the thing. Because then the process also opens up in a certain point with the conductor, with the performers. It doesn't just stop with the set being delivered to the theater or the costumes. It, it, you know, it really doesn't. It, it continues so, and it, you have need, I think it takes a person that's comfortable with that, you know, to, to be able to get into this, right? Yeah. This piece, you know, uh, is one of my favorite things. It was done in 1997. The piece is extremely bizarre. Um, it's called Hopper's Wife. I wouldn't even get into the story because it's absolutely crazy, but it was one of the wonderful pieces to work on. Also directed by Christopher Alden, who I've talked about before. Obviously, it's an exploded uh, hopper painting is mostly what you're looking at. But let's just say that um, um, the character of, of Hopper's wife, who is, of course, in a lot of the paintings, um, in the course of the piece, um, she and this woman that he's having an affair with, decide they're sick of him because he's such a pain, and they decide to move to California, and Mrs. Hopper turns into Head Hopper, and the girlfriend turns into Ava Gardner. Okay, it's crazy, but it was really, it's a piece about censorship in the end. <laughs> but, and it was marvelous. Stuart Wallace wrote the music, and Michael Corey uh, wrote the libretto, um, and I've, I'm working on that currently on their opera of Harvey Milk, which we're, I'm doing this summer, the Opera Theater of St. Louis, in a, in a uh, it's really only, well, the main production was done New, New how many City years ago? Opera. New York City Opera, Houston, and now I'm, I'm back working with Stuart and, um, and Michael, but Michael I've worked with a lot because I did his version of Grapes of Wrath, and also he wrote the, the book for Grey Gardens, so I've done quite a few things with Michael Corey. Uh, the next piece is an opera version of Dolores Claiborne, the Stephen King. Uh, it was done in San Francisco Opera. Um, Tobias Picker is the composer, and the book was by the wonderful, wonderful poet and gentleman, uh, Sandy McClatchy, J.D. McClatchy, who unfortunately died uh, about three years ago. Really complicated production. Um, this is the scene that her husband falls into an old well, and then, of course, she lets him die in there. So what happened for that was, frankly, the scene you see that's raised up is almost twice as long as what you see there, because it all slid over this way, and so they could run a bit, and then he could go and run and fall into this well. So it was a massive set. 
and uh, spent a lot of money, and I think we only did it once. It was not successful. The, the, the opera was not successful. And it, everyone agreed it was not because the production didn't do the best they could. So it just happens sometimes, but that's that. But there's a downstage portal, which it's all done through flashbacks and for her, through her interrogation. So that's what the portal downstage is basically Dolores being interrogated by the, the local police force. And then the other thing you saw as, as um, flashbacks. So it was a fun show to design. This is Orf uh, Orfeo et Eurydice that was done at the Met that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it was one of my, uh, yeah, it was my second or third collaborator with the genius choreographer Mark Morris, who is one of the most remarkable people that, you, you, that I've ever met. Um, I'm, I love him dearly. Um, and it's, uh, it was a, I just absolutely loved this production. Um, the, there was, there were, I think, a hundred people in the in the chorus for the show. If you don't know it, the chorus is a almost a character in it, and um, we decided early on to put them because we knew we were going to have dancers that were um, dancing through a lot of the scenes, the, a lot of dance music, and um, and that we wouldn't it be better, especially when you consider the, when, you know, you often don't have the chorus uh, a lot when you're directing and staging an opera. <laughs> You have very limited accent rehearsal time with them. So Mark was thinking, what am I gonna do with these? A hundred, it's gonna be like between 90 and 100 people. How am I gonna stage them? And then I had this idea. Actually, it was something that, uh, the costume designer was Isaac Mizrahi. And we were having a meeting and somehow I said, what if they were in this thing? And Isaac says, oh, that would be amazing because it reminds me, it's a movie with David Niven, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. And he's a, a, a British airman in World War II, and somehow he ends up, it's just like he shows up in heaven, and he's being adjudicated, I guess to decide if he should be let in, I don't remember. It's a Cahokie movie. But the wonderful thing is that there are all these people arranged in a kind of like amphitheater bleacher seats, uh, and they're, they're dressed as people from all periods. And so I, when I had this idea, Isaac loved it because he said, oh, you know what? All the chorus we, could be famous people from history, all different histories and all different periods. Wouldn't that be exciting? So we had things like, well, Susan B. Anthony was there, <laughs> sitting next to like Attila the Hun. I mean, uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, you know, Galileo. It's all these famous people that, that Isaac, we came up with, we all threw out suggestions. And so it was wonderful to look and you'd see, they would stand up at times and you'd see these people from all different periods. It was really exciting. And it was also moving in that this, all these people, just, it was almost as if all these people came back. All these wonderful people, some of the most important people in the history of the world came back to make this, to help Orfeo through this process. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. It was a great, it was a wonderful idea we ended up with, I thought. Uh, just charming and, and a lot of fun. And the Met even did a thing where um, online they had a thing about uh, uh, who could identify the most people they saw in the thing, having, having seen the opera. So this is the one, this is the scene, this is actually where Orpheus is, um, he's gone, he goes down, the st he goes down, he, he disappears down a trap and then the stairs, some came in this way, and sank, stairs flew in and sank into the floor and then they connected up and with the, the Met elevator raised the whole thing up and so Orpheus ended up uh, you know, around there and they could walk down as we went into the Elysian fields and everything was very dark and then it turned very light and there was this extremely gorgeous dance that happened. So, and, but those, those pieces move, the Oh, the other thing was about it was that the back sides of these things all have the, of that big wall back there, the big curved wall, that's on this sort of donut here. I, I try to turn it, but I'd mess everything up. <laughs> it has a big black wall, almost looks like it's a cave wall with a big slash in it. That is where um, they, or, um, 
uh, Orpheus and Eurydice made their journey back to Earth going up that. And that ended up, that wall comes out, and it's, it's, if you could see this, that wall is hanging over the pit by like four feet. So that was all the way down here. So all of that singing, the most famous, the uh, aria in the piece that Orpheus sings is called Kefaro. And um, so basically that meant the countertenor was basically up off the ground, which is a big help in a theater like the Met, and basically over the orchestra pit when he was singing. So there would, you could not get more downstage than that, <laughs> except if you flew him right over the orchestra pit. So that, that we, we fulfilled our brief for, uh, to Mr. Levine. So, and that's been revived a couple times, and that you can see on this, you know, it's been on TV and whatever. Um, th uh, these productions, this is um, Il Tritico, which are three Puccini operas, um, which I think are absolute genius. It's like, it's like when a great writer um, writes a short story, uh, and some of these are, I think, uh, some of Puccini's greatest works, and I'm a huge Puccini fan, so um, when I say that I think Johnny Skiki is a 100% masterpiece, I really I think that's something, considering there are a lot of other pieces that Puccini wrote that could be called masterpieces. But it's called Il Tritico, which means triptych in Italian. Uh, these are directed by James Robinson, who's, a cl I think I've done, someone asked me the other day, because we were in Chicago working, said, how many shows have you done with Jim? I'm like, it's between 40 and 50. I have no idea how many. Uh, but we have done more shows, I've done more shows with him than any other director. Adore him and adore his work. Um, the first was called Zabaro. The second is for Angelica, which is a piece I have a real weakness for. Um, it, it's, it's, been, it's been to take place in maybe the 16th century or something. But the story about this, uh, about this nun who was forced to give up her child by her rich family did not Seem, seem to me so modern. Maybe that's why he said it in a, maybe it was too modern and that's why he said it in a, a, a you know, way back then. Cause maybe he thought it would be, wouldn't pass the censors. I don't know. Because it's a very modern story. So we did, we did all the pieces in the 50s. Um, people all say that they don't understand why these three pieces should be done together because they don't have anything to do with each other, which I think is a total it's like you need to do some work and figure it out because that's <laughs> totally wrong. One of the things that they're about is they're all about children. They're all about, the first, the first is about this, this couple, the relationship's falling apart. She's having this mad, passionate affair. In the middle of it, there's a scene between the husband and wife. He's older, she's younger. And they talk about their child who died. So Angelica, it's all about the baby she had to give up. And at the end, there's this, it's, it's, it's basically like a miracle. I mean, in the libretto, it says the Virgin Mary appears. She, the Virgin Mary did not appear in this production, but there was definitely felt like a miracle. And then the little boy you've heard about somehow makes an appearance um, looking in the glass door as she's committing suicide. So that's all about children. And then Johnny Skiki, Johnny Skiki, we, is a character from a minor, minor character. He's mentioned like one line in, 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 the, in Dante. Um, and he was, it's the section on the, you know, one of the circles of hell. He was sent to hell and, and, and it's mentioned that Johnny Skiki was this kind of famous sort of shyster in, um, in Renaissance uh, uh, Italy or medieval uh, Florence who um, uh, get, uh, uh, helps a family uh, rewrite a will, all because he's, well, he helps his daughter, it says, and he gets sent to hell. So because his daughter, in the famous aria, O mio babino cara, when she says, oh daddy, please help these people. I know it's breaking the law, but please help them. I love this young man, their nephew, and if, if they, you know, I, I just want to marry him, and if, if, we, if, if, they, if, this, if you change the will and, and it's successful, I'll get to marry him, and I love him more than anything else, and I'll throw myself off the Ponte Vecchio if I can't marry him. Can you please do it? And of course he's like, oh, okay. And at the end he has this wonderful speech about, you know, I, I hope you'll 
approve of my activity. I know it was illegal, but I did it for my daughter. So I don't understand what the hardship is to figure out that these pieces are all very closely linked. And I bet you could go through and you could find two or three other ways that they're linked. But if you do, once again, if you don't know these pieces, I've actually, I've done two different productions of Tree to Go, and I just think that they are, they're just genius. And Johnny Skeek, is the only comedy he wrote, and it's hysterical, and it really is, there's not a note that's not necessary. It's just genius, so anyway. Um, Fire Shut Up On My Bones is my most recent Met project, and it just happened last week. I was in Chicago at Lyric Opera Chicago. They were a co-producer, so is LA Opera. Uh, historic piece because it was um, the first composed, the first opera ever written by a black composer at the Metropolitan Opera, and I can't tell you how proud I am to have been part of it. I did the premiere of the piece at Opera Theatre St. Louis. It was the second piece from Terence Blanchard that they had um, commissioned, and the first piece called Champion is now we're doing it at the Met um, a year from now. A year from now it opens. And it's a story about Emil Griffith, the boxer. Um, but anyway, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And like I said, um, I'm so privileged to have been part of it. And to know Terrence, who's one of the most <laughs> beautiful people I've ever met. So um, these pieces, I, I mean, it kind of speak for themselves. It was a revival of A Thousand Clowns in the year 2000, 2001. It starred Tom Selleck, which made my mom and dad really, really uh, proud. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that, they're both from that. And that was, uh, it, it, it was, uh, we, we started out of town, then it opened at the Long Acre in, on Broadway. This is a production of um, Man of La Mancha that I did at um, the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, 2015. I thought it was a wonderful production, I have to say. And it was, um, it was, there was something about it that seemed very ripe at the time to be doing it, I have to say. It was moving. The whole impossible dream thing was, I don't know, it somehow was more effective than any of us imagined it would be. I think because of you know, politics at the time. So, anyway. Um, this is a, Romeo and Juliet, the, the, the ballet that I did with Mark Morris and Mark Morris Dance Group. It was done at, we, we did it at the Bard Summerfest uh, in upstate New York, and then it was a co-production with the Barbican in London, so it was there, and I think one other place too, I can't remember, well, a couple other places in the United States. I can't remember where. Uh, it was an interesting project because a musicologist had, had found there was evidence of it, talk about it, but Prokofiev, when he did his original scenario for the show, was forced by the Soviet um, censors to rewrite it. Because in his version, um, Romeo and Juliet didn't die. Because interestingly enough, another bit of tidbit of trivia, is that Prokofiev was a Christian scientist. So in Christian scientism, you don't die, you go to a celestial place. And the Soviet censors didn't like that. So he had to change it. They also didn't like that his orchestrations weren't lush enough. There weren't enough strings. There weren't, so all of it was changed. A musicologist found all the original material, found the original orchestrations, and put it back together. And then Mark did a version, because it was interesting, because it was the new version wouldn't sound like something that would be done by a ballet company it sounded more like something to be done by a modern dance company. So Mark did it, and it was absolutely exquisite. I, I always, this piece, um, my friend Marty Pakladinas did the clothes for it. He's a longtime collaborator of Mark's. And we both were talking about how, when we watched the piece, we really felt like we were in a trance for two and a half hours. It was incredible. It was an incredible experience. But um, anyway, all those panels at the end, flipped around and had on a sort of Giotto sky, blue with very stylized gold, gold stars. And this was all based on that, on that, that wonderful um, um, piece in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is that, it's a, the Renaissance study. It's all done with 
inlaid wood, and it's like trompe l'oeil, but with inlaid wood. And we had this idea about doing this thing. And we did it like this, so it had a kind of more modern feel to it. Uh, but, but that's it. Romeo and Juliet. Loved it. Nixon in China, we were the first production, I believe, first professional production that was allowed to happen after the period of time that Peter Sellers' production uh, had to be used. And this was done originally in Opera Theatre of St. Louis, and then back in Houston, where the piece had premiered, original production. Uh, it was done in Toronto. I think it was done about five or six places. So, and that was, uh, there's so much in the piece about how it was one of the first, uh, these big events to be totally televised. And so we got into this idea about doing it all with televisions. And so the TVs, when, when Nixon arrived in, in, um, in Beijing, the, the first time all these televisions flew in, they came to the ground for the first scene. The second scene, people disconnected one of the, like six of them, and then they spent the rest of the evening rolling around at different positions, and the other then lived in the air like this. This scene that's set up is roughly the scene where Pat Nixon is touring the Great Wall of China and all these other things. Um, there's some, there might be some, I don't know, I think there's some pictures of Nixon in China there, and there might be a picture of her, of that scene, because there were a lot of wonderful big props on big poles and stuff. And Maria, Maria Kanyova, yeah. Someone that Jeff knows very well that was in, actually she was in the Trutico. There's a bohem out there she did. She did this, and a genius soprano, I have to say. Break, she, how many times did she break our hearts on stage? Oh Incredible. Anyway, uh, the next is a production of Carmen that I did in Seattle. It was done specifically for the, the marvelous um, mezzo Stephanie Blythe, who's someone that Jim Robinson directed this. He also did the Nixon in China, by the way. Um, and um, they wanted to do, a, Stephanie was a favorite at Seattle Opera because she had done all the ring cycle. Uh, audiences loved her. He wanted to do a production of Carmen for her. Um, Stephanie isn't physically the, the, the kind of, uh, she's not physically and that, like someone that you'd look at and say, oh, she should be Carmen, right? We all think of Carmen as like a, a siren or something. That's not Stephanie. But let me just tell you, I don't think, <laughs> I had the time we were like, I don't think we'll ever hear this song like this again. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, but she was absolutely marvelous. Um, and I thought her portrayal was fabulous because it was so, it was uh, um, so intense because it wasn't uh, about just this kind of like sex kitten. There was something, there was something really deep about her approach. Um, and I think for singers that, that um, aren't naturally a sex kitten, you get actually a more nuanced, interesting performance. You know, I mean, it's often done by people that aren't, are, are physically different. And Stephanie was absolutely marvelous in the show. Um, we started out with a kind of all totally painted set. They were drops that looked like they were old fashioned, you know. We even painted fold lines in it, stuff like they've been in storage. The trouble with the production was that the audience, um, rather than, I remember walking the theater first time and seeing that set set up and it was horrifying, horrifying to see these drops that looked like they were probably moldy. The, the trouble was the audience was sorry when those went away at the end of the first act. <laughs> Which was the same, okay, all right, that's what you want to see, that's what you're going to, that's what you got. But anyway, because um, they basically all either flew out or sank to the ground at the end when Don Jose, when, he's, when you realize, you know, when the piece goes from an opera comique or something that's like, could be Offenbach sometimes, and then it turns into, I mean, the piece ends, it's like Wozzeck. I mean, it's a schizophrenic piece, but I think that's exciting about the piece, so anyway, so that was Carmen in 2004. And this is a musical that's in previews right now on Broadway called Paradise Square. Uh, the model you see here was the model from Berkeley Rep, where we started it out of town. So we'll see, it opens, it opens uh, a week from today, today Sunday, a week from today. It's, a, it's an official opening, but it's in previews right now in New York. So, uh, it takes place in New York in 1863.
the central in the five points neighborhood and the central event that central crisis is um, the draft riots of 1863. Uh, the last this this last model here is Don Pasquale, which I did a glimmer glass in uh, 1996. This might be the oldest model in the show, um, but it was a charming production that then uh, went to New York City Opera as well. And these are costumes from that production because I did the costumes too. And then if we have time, we can zip around the corner and we'll look at the plate rest. We can, we can do a couple minutes still. Okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll take the journey. This is one of my recent favorite productions. It started out at Canadian Opera Company in Toronto and was a co-production with English National Opera in London. And it's the Johann Strauss uh, Later Mouse. This is the first act. And um, it was just a production that I absolutely loved, I have to say. It's a crazy, difficult opera to do in an interesting way. And I thought we really, we really uh, did a, a, a bang up job, I have to say. Um, and um, the one character we sort of treated like, like he was a bit of Sigmund Freud. So we did this whole thing with, hip, with hypnosis, thus the big pocket watch, which was in the whole show. And at one point, the, Dr. Falca, who was sort of our Freud character, um, gets on it with his big bat wings, there's a picture right there, and, uh, and rode it out. It was hanging in the air for a good deal of the third act. So uh, I, don't know how these, I don't know how these singers do it with this flying, you know. The same, in Orfeo, the character of Amor had to be lowered in. She, she flew in. I remember saying to Mark, we talked about her flying in, and I said, how do you want her to fly in? Did she fly in? He said, no, I think she drops in, like, like a tea bag, <laughs> he said. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had to be up in the air. For, I mean, luckily her entrance is early on in the show, but she was up in the air. I, I mean, you're at the Metropolitan Opera. She was probably hanging, I mean, 100 feet in the air and then had to fly in from there. But, you know, you ask them if they, like, are you okay with this or do we need to get somebody else? And, like, incredibly brave what people do. Um, so, all right, but I think that that's a good place to stop yeah, in absolutely. a way. This is the... Where the, gal where the exhibit starts is this, and we're finishing it, so we went a little bit backwards, but anyway, but thank you for being interested and for tuning in. Thanks. I'm just going to turn it back this way. You guys are all good to go have a freshman oh, great. chat, and I'll just give a little outro, and we're fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. That should be good. You're good. You're good. I'm going to your outro real quick. It's such a nice job. <laughs> Thanks. Hi everybody, thank you so much for, sh uh, for showing up for our show uh, virtually. Uh, there's a lot more to look at at the show and we encourage you to come stop by at the Freeman Gallery. Uh, and as I stated at the beginning of the live, we have brand new 73 page catalogs that just came out uh, for this show and the imagery is absolutely stunning. So please stop by, grab a catalog, come check out this work, it's absolutely incredible. There's a whole section we didn't even get to that's just on Alan's sketches. And I absolutely love them and encourage people to come check them out. So thank you again so much. Have a great evening and great rest of the weekend.